Okay, we are on lecture 21, which means we are at the halfway mark. There's 41 lectures in the class. So, well, actually, we're, and, and given the fact that I'm canceling one of them, we're past the halfway point. We passed the halfway point on Friday. So, all right, let me do that. Okay. We have a celebration next week. Um, we celebrate on Wednesday, okay? Uh, just so you're aware, on homework, um, we have homework um, Friday. Do, we have one due Friday and one due Monday. I'm not giving one today, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, uh, the Monday assignment, I'm not going to accept anything late because I'm turning the solution on the moment that you turn it in, okay? So... Uh, we should be pretty straightforward. We're, we're making good progress. Um, one thing I am going to try and look at is I, I'm not a fan of rushing, and I am not a fan of just speeding through material for the sake of speeding through material. But because of where spring break aligned, um, uh, because of where spring breaks uh, aligned, we have one column lecture after spring break. So I'm going to see if I can, not rush, but I'm going to see if I can be somewhat expeditious. Um, and if I can, I might have a surprise for you at the end of the next week, or the end of the week before spring break. So, but let's just get right into it. Okay. Today we're going to talk about welded connections. Um, this is the, I guess, fourth module in the class, because we had our basic stuff at the beginning, and then we had tension members, and we had bolted connections, and we had welded connections. Um, of the modules in this class, this is the easiest. Just, I'll just level with you. It's pretty easy. Um, honestly, I could probably get it done in two lectures, but I kind of want to take our time with it and get it done uh, uh, and do it well. Um, but I want to talk about um, welded connections in general. Um, so that you understand what different types of welding procedures there are, what uh, types of welds uh, that we deposit. Uh, and then we're going to restrict our discussion to fillet welds, which are the, by and large, the most common uh, welding uh, uh, types of welds uh, in practice. Um, now I'm just curious, how many of you have ever welded before? Has anybody here ever welded anything before, ever? Not well, but... <laughs> so, that's how I would answer the question, because I mean, um, when it comes to bolted connections, um, I think with about 20 minutes of training, everybody in this room could be installing bolted connections today. But welding, that's different. Welding's an art, it's hard. It's just point blank, um, it's difficult. You need certifications and training and so on and so forth to do it. Um, I'm sure there's folks out there that would dispute that statement to say, you know, you can calculate your required voltage and your speed and what electrodes you need to know, and just with a little bit of skill, you know, you can deposit perfect welds. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm one of those that, you know, in the end you can um, science it all you want, but there's still just skill and, to be frank, a little bit of art in depositing a quality weld. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about welding, um, the different methods for welding. Um, I'm going to use terms like SMOD, GMOD. You probably have never heard those, but I'll relate them to terms that you have heard before. And then we'll talk about the types of welds that we deposit, like fillet welds, groove welds, uh, things like that. Um, so first off, let's talk about the welding methods. Um, there are four main welding methods that we use in structural applications. Now, when I, when I say uh, structural applications, I mean buildings, I mean bridges, I mean large-scale structural steel applications. So, like, as an example, um, TIG welding, okay? TIG welding is a very common type of welding that we are not going to talk about, okay? Because TIG welding is more for precision-style fabrication. Uh, you see TIG welding in the automotive sector for, like, you know, bicycles and stuff like that. Like, we're not, we're not uh, using TIG welding on buildings and bridges, okay? I'm only really talking about the methods that we use for uh, structural applications, um, we have a few that we use. Um, each of these methods have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, and so let's just sort of get through uh, uh, each of these. Uh, and I want to start with what I would say is the most common. Uh, 
uh, that you'll find, and when I say most common, I mean that every fab shop can do this, okay? And that's stick welding. Okay, how many of you have heard of stick welding? Okay, so many of you probably have, uh, in case you haven't. So um, in general, the way welding works is you're basically connecting one big circuit, okay? So you have your welding machine, uh, and there are essentially two ends of the welding machine. One, and they sort of look like, almost like jumper cables. Um, one of them is attached to the workpiece, um, and the other, in the case of stick welding, is attached to the electrode. So this is an electrode, okay? So I'm actually gonna pass this around, this one, and then I'm gonna pass this one around later. This is the case, and you might go, why not pass them both? You, you'll see why. So this is a weld electrode. Um, you'll notice that it sort of looks like a sparkler. Um, if you've ever seen a sparkler, um, there is an exposed side here at the bottom, and then the rest of it is filled with, or is coated with this granular flux, almost looks like a sandy type, you know, crust on top of it. I'm gonna pass that around. Um, now, like I said, um, in welding, what you're doing is you're completing a circuit. So, you know, you're, um, uh, you've got one end of the uh, uh, you know, cable connected to the workpiece, and the other is connected to the electrode. And once the electrode comes into contact with the, um, the, the steel at the place that you want to form your connection, you complete the circuit, and then electricity starts flowing. Um, what happens is whenever you're welding, you are essentially melting three components. You're melting component A, component B, you know, if you want to connect component A to component B, you're melting plate A and plate B, as well as the electrode. The electrode itself is a consumable. So if you're ever doing stick welding, you're not really taking the electrode and moving it left to right. You're sort of doing this. Because as you move left to right, you are consuming the, the electrode. The electrode itself is melting. So you have to sort of weld in a fashion like this. That's way, you know, um, uh, 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 over exaggerated. But the idea is that you're moving left to right and you're moving down because you're consuming the electrode as you, um, uh, as you move. Now, one of the things that we really want to avoid uh, in um, the depositing of welds is creating welds that are brittle. Brittle welds are bad, really, really bad, okay? Um, the big thing that we really want to avoid getting inside a weld is hydrogen. Hydrogen inside of welds is really bad because that, um, that creates a brittle weld, okay? So how do we avoid that? Okay, because you got to keep in mind, what you're doing is you're melting, you know, the work piece, the, the, the second piece, and then your, um, uh, your electrode. That creates a lot of molten steel, and then as that steel cools down, um, there is a possibility that it could absorb uh, gases in the atmosphere, like hydrogen, okay? So how do we avoid that? Well, in the case of stick welding, that's what that uh, granular coating around the electrode is for. That granular coating uh, is essentially a flux. Once the circuit is complete and you start consuming an electrode, that coating generates a protective gas right here around where the uh, weld uh, uh, is being deposited. And that gas is there to make the uh, hydrogen and other compounds in the uh, atmosphere inert. Okay? So if you're wondering what that coating is, it's a flux designed to ensure that the welds aren't brittle uh, upon depositing. Does that make sense? That's what that flux is, is for, okay? Now, stick welding, um, I, I would say that the main characteristic or the difference between stick welding uh, and MIG welding, how many of you have heard of MIG welding, okay? The difference between stick welding and MIG welding from a structural standpoint is penetration, okay? So stick welding, um, uh, you, you can deposit really deep welds and really large welds uh, uh, pretty effectively. Uh, MIG welding, um, uh, how many of you have MIG welded before? I'm just curious. If, for those of you that have welded, I'm just curious, what do you prefer, stick or MIG? I'm just curious. I've only ever done MIG. You've only ever done MIG? MIG medium. Okay, so it's, it's funny because I've heard experienced welders say they think stick welding is easier. Yeah. And I go, no, I, I think MIG welding is a lot easier. But but I to call me a novice welder would be an extraordinary compliment. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I can get piece of metal A to stick to piece of metal B. 
but you kind of need a sensor bar over the, the, the well valve to box it. <laughs> That's just the truth. Um, okay, so um, MIG welding is, um, you, you, you generally don't get as deep of, a, a, of weld penetration, but MIG welding, at least, I think it's easier, you know? Um, there are a couple of differences with MIG welding versus stick welding in terms of the procedure. So first off, instead of a consumable like this, so like you're using the electrode, and then once you're done, you have to get a new electrode, and then have to get a new one and a new one. MIG welding doesn't work like that. Instead of holding an electrode, what you're holding is this sort of like gun, and it's got a little nozzle on it, and inside the, or on the gun, there's a little trigger, and as you squeeze the trigger, there's a continuous speed of electrode that deposits out. It sort of looks like copper wire. If you've ever seen it, that's kind of what it looks like. Um, and so you don't need to do this. You can just go left to right and it'll, it'll deposit you know, uh, at an even rate. And there are things that you can uh, affect when you run your, your, uh, um, your MIG welder, things like the speed, the voltage, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, now, if you've ever done uh, MIG welding, um, not only do you need the actual just weld consumable, the welding machine, so on and so forth, but you also need a big tank of, uh, uh, of inert gas. And what does that tank do? Well, that tank, as you click the trigger, not only is it depositing electrode, not only is it completing the circuit, but it's depositing that shielding gas as you're uh, placing the... Uh, 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 the weld. And so that gas in that tank from a MIG welder is doing the same thing that the granular, you know, uh, uh, coating on the stick weld is doing. It is, um, it is uh, protecting the weld from things like hydrogen and brittlement. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So stick welding and MIG welding are probably the two most common uh, that you'll find in just about any uh, fab shop. Um, a spin on MIG welding is to use uh, flux cord arc welding. Uh, and basically the difference between um, stick welding, or the difference between MIG welding and this is the electrode itself. Um, so with MIG welding, you have an electrode and a gaseous shield. With flux cord, the electrode itself has a, uh, uh, has a flux um, uh, coating. So when you deposit it, you don't need the, 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 uh, the, the tank of gas or the, uh, uh, the, the shielding gas. Um, if you ever deposit it, you get this sort of like white gritty coating on the weld that you have to kind of chip off. Um, but that's what that is. It's that flux that's protecting the, um, uh, it's protecting the, um, the weld from, from hydrogen and brittlement. I imagine that if any of you have any, um, MIG welding setups, like in your parents' garage and they don't have the big tank, they're probably using this. So, sound good? Probably the least common, but uh, I did want to mention it. Now, what is also uh, becoming more and more common, and I guarantee you, you all probably don't have this in your parents' garage, is submerged welding. Um, submerged welding is definitely something that you will find in a, um, in a fabrication setting, in a professional fabrication setting. So submerged welding, basically what we're talking about is robot welding. Okay, now submerged welding is really, really good when you have a really long weld that you want to place. So we're talking about things like um, welding a flange to a web for like a hundred foot beam. You know what I mean? That's a 100 foot long weld to, to place. That is a long weld to be placed by a human beam. Okay. Uh, so instead, what you do is you get a robot to do it. Now the way that the, the robot works is that there's sort of two arms that, that pass uh, uh, along the, uh, the connection. So one of them deposits this granular flux. It kind of looks like a, like a kitty litter type thing. And then the weld is actually placed under that flux. So when you're placing the weld, it is submerged under that flux, hence submerged arc welding. Um, the idea is that if you're placing a really, really long weld, you can set this up and a robot can do it very effectively. And there's really good quality control uh, and things like that. But there are some limitations. So if you're ever gonna do like submerged arc welding, you can really only place the weld like flat or horizontal, like overhead welds or anything like that. It doesn't really work well with a, a robot doing it uh, and what have you. So you are sort of limited in the, um, 
the, the weld process. Uh, does that make sense? Okay. Now, um, I do want to talk about, so, so those are the welding procedures, the, 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 the equipment that you would use to deposit a weld. But with these different procedures, you can still place different types of welds. Um, what's, whenever you're welding something, what's the first weld that you usually place? A tack weld, right? So a tack weld uh, is used in structural applications, just like it's used in any application. But a tack weld is not structural. What's a tack weld for? Just to put it in place, right? So if you've uh, ever done any carpentry work, and you know the old adage, measure twice, cut once, right? So tack welds are sort of like that. The idea is you um, get your piece where you want it to go, get it lined up, boom, boom, get a couple tack welds on it. And that, that was really quick. Really, when you're placing a tack weld, it's sort of like, about like that, you know? And really, the point is just to get it where it needs to go, and then you can measure it a few times and make sure that it's actually where you want it to be. Because once you start depositing that weld, you better be sure it's where you want it to be, or you are going to be grinding that off for a while. That's going to be very infuriating and very costly, you know, from a labor perspective and so on and so forth. So tack welds are uh, uh, essentially temporary welds that, are, that hold the, the parts in place. And so it's really more of a fabrication concern than it is a structural application. Um, past that, we have actual um, welds that we would use for structural applications. And the most common is a fillet weld. I would bet money that most of you that have welded before, that that's the only type of weld that you placed is a fillet weld. Okay. Uh, for those of you that have welded, is, would that be a fair statement? Um, if you're a little unsure of what I mean by that, don't worry, I've got some pictures here in a second. Now, a groove weld is sort of the, um, we'll have a groove between plates and just fill the thing in with, with uh, weld metal. And that's, groove welds are mostly used to splice plates together. If fillet welds are the most common, groove welds are the second most common. And between these two, these comprise pretty much the bulk of everything that we do in structural engineering. I mean, we do have plug welds and slot welds and whatnot, but they're, they're, they're not as common. Um, so here's some pictures. So this is, a this is maybe what a tack weld looks like. So again, you know, we've got a, a piece A and piece B, and we just hit it a couple times with an, uh, uh, the electrode just to get it uh, attached. This is a fillet weld. So those of you that have actually welded before, I imagine this is really the only thing that you've done is something like this. So basically a fillet weld is when you have piece A and piece B and you're just depositing a weld, a bead of weld uh, along that, uh, that path. One of the things that you'll notice is that fillet welds sort of have like a, maybe like a swirl pattern to them, okay? Most uh, folks who actually weld, they usually don't just go in one path. I'll, I'll exaggerate it. Instead of doing like this, most of the folks that when they learn how to weld, they sort of do like loops. They sort of do this thing when they're placing it. And so if you look at the weld, you'll see these like little swirl patterns. And that's, that's where that comes from. It comes from the, uh, the pattern that the welder is using when they're depositing the weld. And usually it's sort of like uh, cursive E's or cursive L's. You know, that, that's how I was taught is that you sort of like are writing the letter E over and over again. Yeah. You know, that those of you that have welded, it was kind of like that? Okay, all right. Um, groove welds, again, groove welds, basically what you're doing is you're filling uh, an entire, um, uh, an entire uh, 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 groove with weld metal. Um, and so you probably won't ever hear them called groove welds in a fab shop because they're usually either called CJP or PJP welds, either complete joint penetration or partial joint penetration. Essentially, that's saying whether or not the entire groove or the, 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 the groove goes all the way through the thickness of the plate or partially through the thickness of the plate. Um, and from a design standpoint, there's not really a lot of math with groove welds because really what you're doing is you're placing the weld such that the capacity of the base metal governs. And so you just use the base capacity of the metal for, for structural calculation. So there's not a lot there. Everything I just said will make a little bit more sense as we start getting into fillet welds uh, here in a little bit. Um, this is what a plug weld looks like. Basically, you have a plate with a hole in it, and you just fill that with weld metal. So this bottom plate does not have a hole in it. This one does, and you just fill it in. Again, in structural applications, 
not really very common. Okay. Sound good? Okay, so some, some of these terms we have used, uh, we've used these terms a little bit uh, without actually formally um, uh, introducing them from a, a geometry standpoint. So for example, when we've looked at bolted connections, we've looked at lap joints where we've had a plate lapped on top of another plate and I said that was a lap joint. Well, it is. Um, there are a couple of other common configurations that we use when we're welding plate A to plate B. Um, probably the least common is an edge weld where we're actually smacking two plates together and sort of welding right here. That's, that's not as common. Um, T joints, lap joints, and corner joints are really common for fillet welds. Butt joints are probably a little bit more common for groove welds for things like uh, CJP and PJP welds uh, and what have you. Um, but just about any uh, uh, structural engineer is probably going to deal with one of these throughout their, throughout their career. Okay. Now, um, if you've ever physically welded, anybody will tell you that depositing a weld or at least easily depositing a weld is certainly a function of weld orientation, okay? For those of you that have welded, what if I told you to get on a ladder and place a weld between this wall and this ceiling? Would that be easy? No, that'd be tough, right? But what if I told you to deposit a weld between this wall and this floor? That's assuming they're made of steel. I'm, obviously, we're not welding carpet. I'm still going to have a hard time either way. So. But which is going to be easier? The floor. The floor, of course. Of course. Yeah, no, don't, don't get me wrong. Welding's hard. <laughs> it just is. Um, but the welding position or the, um, the, the arrangement of, of the, the geometry of the weld is really important. In fact, one of the things that you will find in a fabrication setting is a serious discussion of if you have a certain piece that you need to fabricate, there's usually a discussion about what order of operations that you do things for this purpose. In other words, you know, you say, okay, I want to weld this plate to this plate first because based on how it's arranged, I can set it like this and it's easy to do. If I wait to do that part last, I might have to have it like this and that makes it a little bit of a harder weld to deposit. You will hear those conversations uh, in a fabrication setting. The, the extent of my skills is I once had to um, deposit a vertical weld. I once had to deposit a weld going like that. Man, that was hard <laughs> because it just kept dripping down and yeah, that was hard. <laughs> I, I spent a long time doing that. That, that, that was the extent of my skill. Um, but yeah, does this make sense? Okay. Okay. Um, has anybody ever seen welding drawings? They are complicated. Okay. Um, I'm actually teaching Engineering 102. I'm teaching Introduction to CAD this semester. And I was thinking about introducing this, but I said, you know what? No, because this is really complicated. Um, so basically, there is a standard legend of, um, of symbols that you use to identify welds. So like, for example, if you have, whoop, so if you have like a plate and a plate and I don't know, let's, let's make something up. Let's point to this, okay? Let's put a flag right here and let's put, I don't know, a quarter inch six or something like that, okay? So what that means is that we're depositing a fillet weld that's a quarter inch in size. It's six inches long. And the little flag means that we're doing it in the field as opposed to in the fab shop, okay? So for example, this is what a, you know, uh, the flag means for field weld. The triangle indicates fillet weld and, and so on and so forth. Um, this gets complicated real quick. I am certainly not, um, going to expect you to get very verbose on welding symbols and welding terminology. This next slide here, um, this is all I expect you to know how to do, okay? So we're only going to be focusing on fillet welds. And, and just so everybody's clear, because I, I see a lot of folks taking notes on this, this is not going to require a big stretch on your memorization because as we start doing problems, as we start um, uh, uh, going through examples and homeworks, 
you'll be using this so much that it will be kind of like second hand. Um, but we're only going to use uh, one type of uh, uh, weld in here, and so only one type of symbology, uh, and that's the fillet weld. And so for fillet welds, what we're going to focus on is the size of the weld and then how long it is. So the length, if this is six inches, we're talking about the length in and out of the screen. So this is depositing a weld that's literally six inches long. And as for the quarter inch, the quarter inch is sort of this dimension right here. We're talking about that size being a, a quarter of an inch and whatnot. Now, if you have a triangle on both sides, so if you're pointing to this and there's a triangle up and down, um, the triangle up and down means that you're depositing the weld on both sides of the plate. Okay, That's about as complicated as it's going to get. It's not going to get any more challenging, any more uh, 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 difficult than this. Okay? Sound good? Okay. All right. So what you all care about as structural engineers is capacity because you need to learn how to size a fillet weld. You need to learn how to deposit or, or to determine the necessary length of welds and the necessary size of welds in order to, uh, to meet capacity demands and whatnot. So we need to learn how to compute that. Okay? So really what you need to understand is the geometry of a weld, and mainly what that is is uh, through a term called the effective throat of a weld. Uh, and then once you understand that, you've got to go through the specifications. So, okay, so here's a fillet weld. I've got some geometry here uh, uh, shown. And what I want to sh talk about is this definition or this term called the effective throat. Okay, so I have here... Uh, over here on the right, probably a more um, realistic view of a fillet weld. So I have here, you know, plate A and plate B, and I have the um, the the weld. Um, sorry, Billy, I got to call you back. Sorry, Billy. Got in the registrar's office. So, um, so uh, I have here a. Uh, I have here a fillet weld placed. Now, if you ever look at a fillet weld in the real world, it's not going to be like a perfect triangle, okay? But for the purposes of capacity calculations and for the purposes of idealization, we can sort of estimate it uh, as such, okay? Now, um, I'm going to take this real world geometry and idealize it over here, okay? So what I have here is a two plates that are welded together, and I have the weld defined by its weld size, which I'm going to call A. So A is what I specify as an engineer, that I want a quarter inch weld, or a 5 16 inch fillet weld, or, or what have you. Okay. So I propose the effective throat is this distance right here, the distance from the root of the weld to the face of the weld. Okay. Now, the distance from the root of the weld to the face of the weld is what I'm calling the effective throat. Now, if I have a triangle that looks like this, uh, my good friend trigonometry tells me that's a 45, 45, 90 triangle, right? And if that's a 45, 45, 90 triangle, and I ask what is the distance between here and here, I can do a little bit of trig, and it's basically just the sine or cosine of 45 degrees. And the sine or cosine of 45 degrees is 1 over the square root of 2, okay? So 1 over the square root of 2 is about 0.707, okay? So I propose that the distance from here to here is about 0.707 of this distance, okay? So when you start seeing this term 0.707, that's just trig, okay? With me so far? Okay. So if you understand that, then this is all you, you need to really navigate the spec. So we're still in Chapter J. Um, J3 is what we spent the past couple weeks in because that was the chapter or section related to bolts. We're in J2. J2 is the section related to welds. Well, let's see if we can paint an analogy. Remember with bolted connections, we said either the bolt is going to fail or the plate is going to fail. Remember bolt shear and bolt bearing? Well, with welds, kind of the same thing. We either have a uh, with a welded connection a situation where the weld metal is going to fail or the base metal is going to fail and the capacity is really straightforward okay the capacity is basically 
a nominal stress times an area. A nominal stress times an area. Okay. Now, um, I did want to mention this is a new uh, 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 modification in the spec. Um, it's not, well, let me be clear. This isn't a new idea in the spec. The spec has accounted for this before. This is just a new notation. If you actually open up the spec, you'll see that to compute the capacity of weld metal, it's uh, the nominal stress times the area times this term KDS. KDS counts for the orientation at which uh, welds are, are, are being loaded. And for most basic welded connections, we just assume a longitudinal orientation. So that means KDS uh, is equal to one. So, there is this term KDS in the spec, but we're going to take it equal to one. And to be clear, in the last spec, while it wasn't listed this way, we still assumed longitudinal orientation anyways. And you'll understand what I mean uh, when we start talking about that uh, a little bit later. Okay. Now these terms come from uh, this table in the spec. This is table J25. And this is a pretty big table. There's a lot going on here. It's actually worth opening up right now. I, I want everybody to open this. This is on 16.1-132. I want everybody to pull this out. This is a really big table. It extends on a couple different pages. pages okay and so I think if you go to the previous page the one on the back it'll say like okay here's groove welds and here's all the limits and then here's plug and slot welds and here's all the limits and so this one on page 132 there's a section that says fillet welds including fillets and holes and da -da 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 -da. okay under this section we have low uh, welds that are loaded in shear and welds that are loaded in tension. We're going to assume for the sake of discussion that all of our welds are loaded in shear, okay? Because we're basically assuming shear along the effective throat, okay? So we have whether or not we're considering the base metal or whether or not we're considering the weld metal. So right now we're looking at the weld metal. So what does this tell us? It tells us the B value is 0.75. It tells us something about the area of the weld, which we'll get to here in a bit. But then it says the nominal stress of the weld metal. So basically, this is the amount of stress that the weld metal can withstand. So what does it say? It says that the nominal stress is 0.6 times FEXX. There's that 0.6 again, right? Remember, that 0.6 is not a factor of safety. It's because we are assuming that the effective throat is resisting the load in shear. Remember, whenever there's a shear, we reduce the capacity because the element is in shear. It has nothing to do with the factor of safety. It's because under shear, metals can resist loads up to about 60% of their capacity, right? Now the other number, FEXX, what the heck is FEXX? FEXX is the electrode strain. And where does that come from? It comes from the weld metal itself. So this weld electrode that I passed around, okay, it came from this pack from Lincoln Electric, okay? This right here is an E6013 uh, electrode, okay? So I'm going to pass this around, okay? So this is an E6013 electrode, and just see where that box will open, so maybe try to spell it out. Okay, so what do these numbers mean? So E60 corresponds to the electrode strength. So this E60 electrode that I'm passing around can withstand 60 KSI, okay? Um, this uh, first number corresponds to the welding position. So the one I'm passing around is an E6013. So that one says that we can weld it in all positions. So if it was an E6033, we can only weld it in flat positions. Okay. Now the last number uh, corresponds to other special characteristics like the polarity or the type of flux or whatnot. Uh, but for our um, purposes, we really only care about the first two numbers where it says E60. And so E60 has an electrode strength of 60 KSI. So if I used E80 electrodes to be 80 KSI, if I used E70 to be 70 KSI uh, and what have you. So just throwing that out there. Now what about the area? What's the area? The area is the length of the weld multiplied by the effective throw. So if I want to determine the capacity, what do I need? I need a fee value of 0.75, 
I need a stress, which is 0.6 times the electrode strength, and I need an area. An area is the effective throat times the length of the weld by golly gosh gee. Okay? So this term will tell you this is how you compute the capacity of a weld according to its weld metal. In other words, this is how much load it will take to fail the weld itself. The next question we got to ask is whether or not we fail the base metal, whether we fail the plate. Okay? Does that make sense? And where is this coming from? We have a feed value of 0.75. We have an electrode strength of 0.6 EXX. And then we have our effective throat times the weld length. Okay. So far so good? Okay. Now that's the weld metal. What about the base metal? Well, if I go to the base metal, base metal says governed by J4. Okay. What does that mean? That means we need to turn to section J4. And, and, and I just got to take a step back and just say, listen, I know that if you're, so in the real world, unfortunately, sometimes you are having to hop around the specification. Okay. Because you'll be trying to design some connection. So you open the spec and then it says, okay, you got to go to here to find this value. And then you go to the next section. This section says, oh no, you got to go here to find this value. Unfortunately, that's just sort of the nature of specifications. Sometimes you kind of need to just hop around. So my apologies on that. But when you're writing specifications, you're writing specifications for any scenario. And then you come in, well, I want to know how to design my scenario. Well, in order to design your scenario, you might have to hop around a little bit. So that's just sort of the nature of the beast. Okay. So if I go to section J4, J4 has some organization. Okay. So there's a J4-1, which is strength of elements and tension. There's a J4-2, strength of elements and shear. That's what we're looking at. And by the way, what is J4-3? Have we looked at J43 before? Block shear. So see what I mean? So section J2 is on welds. J3 is on bolts. J4 is on connecting elements. So J4 is when we're looking at the, the plate, the base metal itself. Okay. So how do we compute the capacity? Well, look at this. For elements in shear, 0.6 FY AGV, 0.6 FU ANV. Haven't we seen AGV and ANV before? We saw that when we were looking at block shear, right? Here's the best part. Remember that net area is the gross area minus the area lost due to the presence of bolts? Due to the presence of what? Bolts? We're not dealing with bolted connections. We're dealing with welded connections, right? So in this scenario, for fillet welds, the net area equals the gross area. Okay, so they're the same because you're not drilling, you're not removing material from the plate in order to deposit your connection. Okay, so AGV is going to equal ANV for a fillet weld. Okay, does that make sense? So I can summarize everything right here. By golly gosh gee. So I have my weld metal capacity and my base metal capacity. Okay. Oh, sorry, let me go back. Let me go back. So my weld metal capacity is just phi times the stress times the area, and my base metal capacity is just phi times the stress times the area. And with both situations, the stress is 0.6 times some limiting value. Okay? Now with base metal, what we have is we have the possibility of either the metal yielding or the metal metal rupturing. So we have two different phi values, two different capacities. But again, I think when we start applying these, you're going to go, wow, this is, um, this, is, this is really easy, okay? All right, I'm going to give everybody a sec because I know some folks are writing this. I wanted to book in my presentation with a, hey, here it is slide. And again, once you start using this, you're going to go, wow, this is, this is pretty easy, okay? Anybody have this? Anybody need a minute? Everybody good? Okay. All right. I want to maybe talk a little bit about the next lecture. If I don't get to it, um, if I don't get to finish this, I, I will. Just so everybody's aware, um, I want to...
see how expeditiously we can move through this. So I want to see if we can get through columns before spring break. I want to see if we can. I don't know if we can, but we'll see. Okay. All right. So um, let's let's go through this fillet weld connection uh, lecture a little bit, and I won't rush. I'll take my time with it. So this is where you know we left off with with this. Um, I want to set the stage a little bit for what's going on here. Um, let's go back to bolted connections. Remember how we had a discussion about the capacity of a bolted connection. We said, here's how you compute bolt shear. Here's how you compute bolt bearing. But there was more to it than that because there's also the issue of bolt spacing and edge distance requirements, right? And we said, that has nothing to do with the capacity, right? Bolts can't get too close together because you have to be able to get a wrench around them to tighten them. And bolts can't get too far apart because you can get water between the plates, right? That had nothing to do with strength. That was a completely separate issue. Well, I propose there are limits on weld size and weld length as well, okay? So we're gonna talk a little bit about that uh, uh, here in a bit. Now, um, one thing that does pop up is the issue of weld orientation. Okay, now um, what I mean by weld orientation uh, is this. So I have a plate and I'm yanking on that plate uh, in tension and I have a couple of different weld options. Okay, so I have on the left, I have a weld that for the sake of discussion, we will say that weld is entirely loaded in shear. Okay, the load in the middle is a transverse weld, and we'll say for the sake of discussion that weld is loaded entirely in tension, okay? If I'm relating it to like block shear, right? Remember the loads on the left would be your shear paths, the load in the middle would be your um, tension path. Make sense? Okay, the load on the right would be an incline weld. So that would be somewhere in between, either a weld in shear, a weld in tension, or somewhere in between, okay? Now, um, what I propose to you is that as a practicing engineer, you are the one that is in charge of how you place welds, okay? Like you're the one designing it. But I think it would be a very bad idea to design a connection with only transverse welds. And I propose to you, you should never do it, okay? I'm not saying, I'm not saying that you can't use a transverse weld, go ahead. But always use a transverse weld in concert with a longitudinal weld. In other words, design connections with either only longitudinal welds or longitudinal welds and transverse welds, okay? Now, if you're going, why? Like, why, okay? The answer is on the next slide, okay? So this is a load deflection plot, okay? So basically what I'm doing is I'm going down to the lab and I'm yanking on some welded connections. And I'm trying to figure out what their capacity is, okay? Now, what we're seeing is the amount of load being applied versus the amount of resulting deformation for welds along a series of orientations. So this first one, this is a longitudinal weld, okay? This next one up here, this is a transverse weld, okay? So these are all welds in between. So 15, 30, 45, you know, so on and so forth. Okay, so what can you tell me about transverse welds? Are transverse welds stronger than longitudinal welds or are they weaker? A lot, well, I mean, we were able to resist more load. I propose they're stronger, but there's another problem. They're more brittle. They're more brittle. That's what I'm looking for. Transverse welds can resist load better, but they're more brittle. They will be able to withstand less deformation. So when a, tran when a longitudinal weld is going to fail, there's a lot of warning. When a transverse weld fails, it goes, okay? so. Whenever you're designing a connection, you never want to solely use a transverse weld because 
of a loss of ductility, okay? Now, when we come back on Wednesday, I'm gonna have a video of a very funny example regarding a McDonald's in Oklahoma um, where you can see what happens when you use only a transverse weld. Um, the video is a little long, so I'll wait till, till Wednesday, but it's pretty funny. You'll, you'll get a kick out of it. It's about a McDonald's that straddles the interstate. It's like, you know how there's an over, you know how bridges have overpass or overpass bridge over the interstate? Well, instead of a bridge, there's a restaurant. It's a McDonald's restaurant that actually straddles the interstate. And there's a, a very funny story about a weld in that McDonald's. I'll tell you on Wednesday. And with that, here's what I want to do. I don't want to rush this. So um, I'm going to pause for now. We're going to get into fillet weld limitations on Wednesday. Um, and then we're going to get into our uh, in-class examples. Um, basically, what I want to do is I want to... I think computing the capacity of a weld is really easy. I want to make sure that you understand what the limits are on weld placement, like why you would want to place the largest weld possible as opposed to the smallest weld possible and stuff like that. Um, and I don't want to information overload you on a Monday morning in a cold classroom. So with that, we will wait until Wednesday to go through fillet weld limitations. So I'm going to stop it for now. I'm going to pull up the code for everybody that didn't get a chance to scan it, and I will see you all on Wednesday.